it is a pleasure to be here today, and it is also a, an honorable task uh, to share the stage with Dr. June Dobbs Butts. Uh, I want to I want to be clear about something. Uh, today we're going to talk about Dr. Butts. Uh, I'm just on the stage, so I, I'm the small person. We're we're, we're amongst a living legend. Um, I want to say this. I I had the pleasure of sitting down with Dr. Butts on Thursday, and uh, we just had a very wonderful we had a wonderful conversation. And one of the things that I left there saying to myself is that oftentimes uh, Dr. June Dobbs Butts is presented as the last uh, surviving daughter of John Wesley Dobbs, the unofficial mayor of the Sweet Auburn District and the Atlanta Negro Voters League, uh, founder of the Atlanta Negro Voters League, the last surviving aunt of the Honorable Maynard Holbrook Jackson Jr. However, I want her to talk and tell you all who she is on her own terms. And when she talks to you all, you will know very clearly that she stands on her own two feet. So we're gonna do this <laughs> In an interview style, uh, I'm going to just kind of open uh, the interview up with a series of questions, very easy questions to kind of break the ice. And then uh, we'll move forward. We'll talk about the Atlanta that she grew up in that just so happens to be uh, at the same time that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. grew up that, and she had a very close relationship with. And then we'll move uh, on from there. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Butts, could you tell us the date and place uh, that you were born? Uh, Thank you. I was born on June the 11th, 1928. You're just coming on 90 years. If you're not that good in math, I can tell you. <laughs> and um, he was six months younger. I met him when we were about 13. And um, the very house that he and his family moved into was um, a, a spot that I loved because it was the home of, before they moved in, the families that lived there were named Bernie, Mrs. Bernie and her brother. It was a two-family edifice, and uh, the Bernie home was very, very well known. And I knew every room, and it was a two-family home. It was, it was on a hill. The hill doesn't exist anymore. Uh, when they were making a memorial for Martin Luther King, they leveled all that land. But in my memory, as a child, I lived a block away and facing a different direction. But Boulevard, as we called that whole street, was prominent for about two or three blocks with the homes of some millionaires in Atlanta. Um, the, the Bernie House was not where millionaires lived, but Caddy Corner in the next block was a gorgeous home um, when I grew up, occupied by an AME bishop, Fountain, who had many daughters a little bit older than my bevy of sisters. So uh, I knew the neighborhood, and we were very proud of that little segment of um, rich homes. But the Bernie home we really knew because the girl who lived there, Catherine Bernie, whom we called Cat Bernie, was the best friend of my immediate sister. And we would go up the driveway, walk into the kitchen, and if we could, eat, eat something. Well, the housekeeper frowned on that. Her name was Mrs. Georgia Lewis, and she was a great cook, renowned cook, thin little wiry lady, and she would frown most of the time. And that was to freeze you out from stealing food. And then when uh, the Bernies moved out, the King family moved in. And we knew that they had children, but I didn't know that they would really be playmates or like us or whatever. And my dad didn't let us play with boys. That was an arch rule in our house, no boys. So I didn't know whether we'd fit in with the new kids in the Bernie house. But what I found out, the first uh, way of knowing that a change had come was through this housekeeper, Mrs. Georgia Lewis. She would smile, and she would offer us food, and it was a new home, that she, new family she was working for. In their church, in Reverend King's church, she was a church mother, so she had great esteem. And that's the thing about the black family. You can be somebody's domestic and somebody else's church mother. And so they knew her as Mother Lewis, 
and gave her great respect. And, she, and it showered down to all the little visiting children who would float up the driveway and, and look hungrily at what she was cooking. <laughs> so that was the first idea that a change had come. Uh, Christine was a little bit older than I, and I didn't ever get to know her. She's a little bit more distant, sweet person, but just a little bit more distant. Her brother, who was six months younger than I, we called ML, and what I didn't realize was just about that time, his father was changing their name. He legitimately changed it from Michael, his own name also, to... Um, to, to Martin, for Martin Luther. Martin Luther King became his legal new name. He had been Michael something before. But he was in college, he was studying, and he was caught up in the majesty of Martin Luther's life, and he wanted to carry on that same claim to fame. And so um, we called the boys ML and AD. Now AD's name was particularly interesting because the full name was A.D. Williams King. He was named for Mrs. King's father. And that's where I have to bring in another um, knot in this embroidery. My father adored A.D. Williams when he first came to Atlanta. He was about 17, my father. And A.D. Williams was very much respected as an intelligent, grassroots preacher, not educated, but fundamentally smart. It was a good heart who cared about his people. And he believed that the ballot was as important as going to church. Now, maybe that's my interpretation, as important. He believed it was extremely important. And he felt that everybody in his church should vote and own property and try to pay taxes and be a good citizen. So he brought that out in Ebenezer Baptist Church. Reverend King, whether he was Michael and soon became Martin, had moved to Atlanta when he was about 15, and he considered himself just a country boy. And he um, started going to Reverend A.D. Williams' church and went under his spell and liked him and married his daughter. And that's how he got into Ebenezer Baptist Church. My dad and Reverend King clashed on a lot of political views. And... Um, and, and just to fill that out, because they saw life differently, um, my dad did not want to cooperate with the Fox Theater and the rest of Atlanta when they were getting ready to celebrate Gone with the Wind. That was the biggest thing that happened. We had a four-day state holiday. And um, blacks had been able to sit in the very top of the Fox Theater, entering from the outside, not no private elevator inside. And so this was forbidden in my family. My father looked down on that and he said, we shouldn't attend the Fox, we didn't need that. And he didn't believe in paying money to go to segregated things. He said, you have to ride the streetcar, that's segregated. But you don't have to go to a movie downtown, you don't have to go to a, a, a musical event, much as I would like to. I remember once he did go to um, here, the violinist, I can't think of his name, very famous violinist. And, he's, and so we had to sit in the very top of the balcony in a row, uh, maybe a couple of rows of seats that were reserved for black patrons. But he didn't approve of that, and he didn't encourage our doing that. So um, there were many points of view where he stood out, but on the business of not attending segregated events downtown, the kings were in accordance with that. So for, for all these many different reasons, oh, another little factor that brought our families together, aside from him, him having liked um, the father-in-law, the fact that, um, um, I'm forgetting. I can't remember what I started to say. I'll well, just say well, it was something about what brought us, oh, my sister, Irene, my first sister, had given piano lessons to Mrs. King, so they had a kind of nice relationship. And we had all kinds of interesting people, um, religious backgrounds, especially in, my, in two blocks around my house. Within my same block, there was a sanctified minister who was rich, nobody compared with that house. 
they had silk wallpaper and a big piano, and my sister gave piano lessons to that lady, too. Um, she never did really learn how to play the piano. But the children were unruly, and my mother didn't like our playing with the children, so we didn't go there. But the main focal point facing our house was David T. Howard School. It was the first black school named for a black person, first school named for a black person in Atlanta. And I really um, was allowed to go with my sister to first grade, second grade, and third grade. If you could fit into the chair, they had benches. And so if you could sit with your sibling, you could stay for the morning. Then the principal would come through every classroom and put the little ones out tell them to go. She'd see us across the street and we'd run home. And <laughs> so that was the neighborhood um, watch, care, watch keep. One of the things that, that I couldn't read, no one taught me to read, but I could sing and the song books were amazing. And I'll never forget one little song that uh, showed a white boy in the center and around him like a clock were kids from other lands with different clothes and all. And the words were something like little Little Indian Sioux or Crow, Little Frosty Eskimo, Little Turk or Japanese. Oh, don't you wish that you were me, that you were me, that you were me. And I used to think, no. <laughs> so I had my own little song, you know, that I'd sing to that page. But nobody taught me to read Maynard, and maybe you have to stop me from jumping around. <laughs> That kind of thing. Okay. Maynard, when he married my sister, was 34 when I was born. So maybe he was about 38 when, when I remember this. He gave me a book, and, um, and I was so delighted. Now, nobody stopped and taught me how to read, but I slept with the book under my pillow, and I memorized it. And so I would tell you, you know, the little girl did this and that, and, and you'd say this and that, turn the page, and then so-and-so would happen and turn the page. I could go through the whole book. But nobody taught me to read. <laughs> so I was four. And when I was five, I went to first grade. Shall I keep on? Tell, okay. Please. So, I went so to, we've discussed some of this, but I, I want her to assert it in the ways because then I'm going to follow up with some kind of focus questions around these. But okay. go ahead. Tell, right. tell it. Well, I'll just tell this little anecdote, and that'll be it. I, um, I was in, um, I knew my way, and we had to stand outside the little gate before they let us new students in. And one little girl was talking with me, you know, what's your name, when were you born, when is your birthday, and all. We were a day apart for a birthday, and I forgot my name. And so when the bell rang, new students could come in. I dashed right to the first grade, because I knew the teacher and I knew where to go. And I was sitting in a seat, and I didn't like it because it smelled of urine. And the little kids would wet the floor, and it would roll down. And I was thinking, this isn't fun, like sitting with my sister in the bigger grades, you know. So at any rate, um, a lady soon came to the door and said, that child is five years old. And the new rule was that you had to be six. And so the teacher, of course, knew that I was five, but she had told my mother just to let me in. And my mother was, she had her plans made for what she was going to do. She had always stayed at home with the children, and she wanted now to start doing things, hey there, in her church and, and in a YWCA and so forth. So my um, teacher told me, June, you have to go home. Sorry. And, and I couldn't believe I was being kicked out the very first day of school. But when I came home and rang the doorbell and Mama opened the door, when she looked, I'll never forget her face, poor the lady, she almost fainted. She said, what did you do? And I said, I don't know. I really didn't know, but suddenly I was kicked out of school. So she told my dad, she has to go somewhere. She just has to go to school. And they knew of a private school across town, which took an hour to get there by bus and cost money. He had to take out a loan. But she insisted the child has to go somewhere. So they put me in school in Oglethorpe, which was a part of Atlanta University. And my friend Jeff has taught there at Oglethorpe. And um, so you have to just stop me because I go on and on. Well, let, I want to put it in context for you. So all of this is in the old Fourth Ward area. You grew up in First Congregational Church. Yes. 
um, we know, could walk. It was the same street, Houston Street. Okay. Years later, Maynard named the street for my father, J John Wesley Dobbs, but it was Houston Street. And we could walk to church and junior choir rehearsals and that, that kind of thing. We walked everywhere. Well, I want to kind of just dive off into something. You and I had this conversation, but um, the book with Peace Tree Me, Sweet Auburn, uh, tells a story of yourself and your sister, Maddie Wilder, along with uh, Dr. King, Emil, as you would call him, and A.D. King, and you all were playing a game. Can, yes. can, you, write, can you write the wrongs of that story for us? Thank right you. Now? It does hurt me that my sister Maddie Wilder was a better opera singer than she was a historian. And she kind of got that wrong. <laughs> he didn't cheat at the game, I did. It was, it was A.D. and myself. A.D. had an old set of Monopoly somewhere around the house and he found all these $500 bills and so, and he said, he whispered, he said, if you want to be the monopolist, every now and then I'll slip you a $500 bill. It's the money, you'd think Donald Trump was giving him advice. He said, it's the money that helps you get to be the monopolist. So every now and then I'd turn out to be the monopolist, and I loved it. And um, it took us maybe, I don't know, a month or so. The t the, those of us who played together were two first cousins, the Bernie girls. Remember, the kings had moved into this house evacuated by a Bernie. That was one of the two, of the two cousins. And um, they lived in separate houses, the two Dobbs sisters and the three king children. And we'd take turns, after we did our washing and ironing and cleaning for the summer, we did that in the morning, then we would fix a little lunch and invite people to come over and play Monopoly, and we went around to the four houses. And um, so when we, when we started cheating, it, it went along for several, maybe almost a year. And it was a lot of fun, a lot of fun. Until we got caught, which was inevitable, and ML was so outraged, he cuffed A.D. like that with the back of his cuff and knocked him silly. And I was so afraid he was going to hit me, but he didn't hit me. <laughs> but Maddie Wilder was frowning, and the other girls laughed. They thought it was funny. They wanted to know, how did we manage to pass the money? And they never saw it, you know. And, and we, we just thought it was funny. But he really was um, turned off by that. And he didn't think it was funny one little bit. So we stopped playing Monopoly. Well, I told the author of Where Peachtree Meets uh, Sweet Auburn, Gary Pomerantz, I told him that Maddie Wilde had made a mistake. I wish he had interviewed me about that. Because usually he cross-referenced all of our interviews. But he said it was too late to change it. It was, it was being printed. I said, but you've got to change it because he didn't cheat. And so years later, I was still arguing with Maddie Wilder once, and she said, you just think he was perfect. I said, well, damn near perfect. I mean, really, I don't mind saying if, if I saw flaws, and I did see a few, but not for the things I was talking about. That's the way I saw him. And he didn't cheat. He, I mean, it was no fun for him. So um, yes, I tell that story because it should have been corrected. Coretta asked me many, many years later if I would work with her. If, if Jimmy Carter was reelected, she was going to come into some political clout and have a little um, payroll, and she could hire me, and if I would work with her. And, um, and I was uh, touched. But I had just gone out to work with Masters and Johnson, mm -hmm. and, I, and I was getting a divorce, and I was coming into my own. And I felt like intellectually, I'm just standing on my own feet. And this is a, it may not be um, easy to talk about people's sex life seriously. You can tell a joke, but don't talk seriously. That upsets people. But I was curious and interested and involved with counseling. And I found so much of, um, especially for women, uh, trauma difficulties, lying, all kinds of um, ragtail troubles um, in the field of human sexuality. And, and I wanted to work with that. And so I told her, you know, I wouldn't be free, but I did appreciate her. And then that's when she asked me, she said, just tell me the truth. Did he cheat at Monopoly? <laughs> it bothered her. I said, no, he didn't. Maddie Wilder just made a mistake. She forgot and mixed it up in her history. 
And that's the way history is. History is who writes the story of what happened. History is not just what happened. It's who writes it, who weaves the cloth of telling the story. And women are always interesting weavers, you know. Well, I, and so. I want to I add to that because we're going to get to the, the conversation around sex therapy in, in a few minutes. Um, that is true. History, historically, history has always been written by the weavers, but there's been a new movement, this new insurgent movement to write it from the bottom up, which means that you can't always rely on archival or primary sources. And then you also have to always think about it is that memory is not a reliable source. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, is you have to corroborate both of the stories and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But um, we were talking and uh, you talked about the transition of, of Dr. King, ML as you would call him. I, I am not privileged to ever call Dr. King ML. So I, I won't even try to do that. It doesn't fit. It, 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 if it, it doesn't it, it, fit, right. you know, don't but worry. You, you talked about the time that he sent a note to your father. Yeah. To ask your father for permission to, to use some language. And, and I want you to talk about not only Dr. King's kind of ascendancy, but like how your father was such a vital role, you know, outside of Dr. King's own family. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that is a very interesting um, meeting of the minds. My dad uh, was a very colorful oratorical speaker, and he had studied elocution in school when he finally got the chance to go to school at nine years old. <laughs> but uh, ML was very much taken by a little anecdote that my dad used in his speeches, and he asked his permission to use it and put it through his own filter. And he came out to his office and he made the appointment to meet my dad at his unair conditioned office in 90 degree weather. And my dad came home ecstatic. He said, that boy's gonna go far. He really is so polite. He came with a hat on and a tie and, and a suit. And you know, he asked permission as formal as he could and all. And my dad was delighted. He knew the anecdote and he said, you take it, you use it, mold it any way you want to. But shall I tell that little story? Okay. During the Civil War, um, so my dad would say in his political speeches, there was one general who had crack troops that were being surrounded and they were about to be annihilated. And, and it was a surprise. And so he sent word to tell the drummer boy to beat a retreat and nothing happened. And a moment went by and another minute went by and he heard his men screaming and being wounded and all. So he jumped on his horse and he rode down the line till he came to the drummer boy who was standing there petrified. And he said, boy, didn't you get my order to beat a retreat? The boy said, uh, uh, yes, sir. And he said, well, well, boy, why didn't you beat the retreat? He said, sir, I don't know how. He said, what do you mean, boy? How long have you been with me? The boy said, sir, I've been with you three years. He said, boy, you don't know how to beat, well, what do you know? The boy said, sir, with you, I don't know how to beat a forward march. He said, threw his hat down on the ground and said, damn it, boy, beat your forward march. And the boys da -da 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 started beating the forward march, and they plunged into battle and won that battle. Of course, the crowd went wild, you know, screaming and whistling and stamping the feet and carrying on. And my dad would just strut up and down the aisle in the front, and then... He had held out his hands and said, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, I don't know whether we won that battle or not, but I know we won the war. And then, of course, they would burst out more. So that's what ML wanted permission to use in his filter. And it did. He put it through his filter, and it became the drum major for justice, the drum major for justice. And, and there was something, if you ever went to, we had one high school for black kids for the county, not just Atlanta, the county. And it was terribly overrun. But that marching band was something else. And the drum majors were something else. And it was not, as Maya Angelou thought, a silly, vapid kind of honor. When he talked about being a drum major, it, sure it had style, mm -hmm. but why not, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. There was a coolness in it that, that I can't really convey because I don't have the words. But um, 
I understood what he meant. And I wrote an article that came out in um, the Atlanta Constitution. I don't remember the year, so that's what I'm trying to identify now. Um, this article s summarizes what I just told as a little story, an anecdote, and it was published um, in 2011. Ah, oh, but a little time and everything becomes history. <laughs> so, so when I think of ML, um, by this time, uh, you know, he's long dead, and Maya Angelou stopped this monument from having um, the drum major touch. You know, she just didn't get it, but she was influential enough, and and that's part of history too. So. Um, you know, I, th I used to grieve over things like that, and then I decided it doesn't matter. In my recollection, in my history, I remember it all too well because we were so proud of our marching bands at, at Washington High, and there were some girl drum majorettes who were fantastic. I mean, they could twirl that baton and look pretty. You know, takes a little bit of skill, and <laughs> they were good. So we, we, um, we were proud of that. It was not vapid. That's the whole word that, that I think she was afraid that ML would come off looking superficial, but he didn't feel it in a superficial way. It, but well, you can't get every little nuance. That's the part of historians right. to put it together and interpret what that person was trying to express. And I think express is a good word because one of the ways in which it is kind of detailed is we're talking about the aesthetic of blackness, particularly in a segregated Atlanta, we're also talking about the pomp and circumstance, the pageantry of blackness. Amen. And, exactly. And, and uh, you know, drum and it had it, rhythm. It had rhythm. <laughs> it has style, soul, grace, and expression. It's it's one thing to be principled, but it's another thing to look good in doing it. And that is a certain aspect of the pageantry of blackness. I want to emphasize that if you look at African rituals, they have a um, a joyousness, you know, like can you dance? Can you breathe? If you can breathe, you can dance. I mean, you just got to feel it. And if you don't feel it, then you have to free yourself up and be around it, preferably from one year old. <laughs> but, but the rhythm, the group movements, the, um, the whole ambiance, as the French would say, is, is something that they feel at home with and we are just beginning to. It used to be that in homes, when, when certain music would come on the radio, everybody would dance. We weren't putting on, you just dance. Little babies would jiggle. <laughs> and and it, there was a freedom to it. Now kids say, oh, I don't know that. I don't know the name of that dance. Or what. You do your thing. You know, you respond with your beat. And... Um, so, of course, dancing has changed. There was a time when, when people wanted to imitate what rich people did or what courtly people did at, at the court. And so they would imitate certain steps, a minuet or some other gavat or something like that. Um, but, but group dancing allows the individual to, to respond in her or his own way. Most recently, um the Alvin Ailey dancers who were at the Fox. Uh, Sue Ross and I walked in together that night. Uh, and uh, I, was, I was at the Fox, and there's a part of um, the most recent Alvin Ailey uh, repertoire to where I just had to stop in the middle of the, of the expression and say, black folk are special. <laughs> but I want to kind of shift this, and I, I want you to remember when your sister Maddie Wilder sung at the Fox and what that meant to your family and how the family responded to that. Well, when, when I, I wasn't here when the mayor gave her the keys to the city, but she was honored um, at some point in her career. And she never allowed strict segregation. She might have had the house divided like Marin Anderson did, but there were never, she said she'd never sing in a place where uh, blacks couldn't come in or had just one row or something like that. And um, I'm trying to think of the man's name, a famous black singer 
who sang gospel and, and Ray Charles. When Ray Charles became affluent, he made a rule that he would not allow any kind of segregation in his, or at least he wouldn't have blacks relegated to the very back. Um, many people did that. I remember going to hear Paul Robeson at a church because he said people should sit first come, first serve. Well, whites came and they came on time and they were ready for the concert. They came early. Blacks were late. <laughs> But there was no black section, and, and that was at um, Wheat Street Baptist Church. That was a new church at the time that Paul Robeson sang there, and he was magnificent. Um, and at Spelman College, they would give a Christmas carol concert. They finally had to have three nights of it, because the first night, white people would turn out and sit anywhere they could to get a seat, and the music was beautiful. It was Christmas songs from all over the world. And... Um, and that was always a joy. Now they give three nights of the Christmas carol concert, two at Spelman, one at Morehouse, and it's still not enough. And people, of course, we, you know, we have desegregation now, but in the days of segregation, it was uh, an insult to have to walk in and to go to um, the very, very back. But as I said, oh, here's what I didn't get to finish. When they were giving Gone with the Wind, arranging for it, um, black churches were asked to bring their choirs and to take turns singing all day and into the night outdoors. They weren't going to be allowed to come into the movie, but um, a group of black men, certain doctors and lawyers, my dad as a businessman, about 10 men went around to the ministers and asked them, don't send your choir. And they begged Reverend King, don't send your two or three choirs to, to sing. And he said, well, slavery really did exist. It's not like we're making up a lie. I mean, you know, we didn't invent slavery, but we can uh, be a part of this because it's a big state holiday, four-day holiday. And my dad's point of view and his committee's point of view was that we don't have to celebrate it. If they want to memorialize or, or deify slavery, let them do it. We don't have to go along with that. But the kings went. And so the king children were dressed like little pickaninnies, and they stood outdoors and sang. And I've talked with Christine about this over the years. She cries. She doesn't like to remember it. And, um, and that's unfortunate, because at the time, children do what their parents make them do. So they had to go. But, um, but I remember my dad wouldn't read the book. He didn't, read, he didn't come to the movie. But my mother stood on the sidewalk with us so we could see the cavalcade of movie stars come down. And we saw Clark Gable, Carol Lombard, and all these people. And the girl who, woman who played Mammy, I can't remember. Yeah. And that took all, most of the day. But that was unforgettable. And, um, but I didn't want to go to the Fox. I, I just, you know, I, I could see the horror in that. Furthermore, they were selling out the, the very top, all of the seats at huge prices. So um, they didn't allow people, the blacks, to come in at all. But wishfully thinking, it was gone with the wind. Which is, uh, the interesting thing about gone with the wind is that's, a, that's the fake narrative of a lot of the issues that we see in terms of this old South public memorials, that's, it's based on a, a whole fictive notion. But I, I want to kind of shift here for a second, and I want to talk about you and your sisters. Okay. Uh, you're the youngest of, of, of six uh, sisters, and uh, you, know, you, you were telling me stories about your father did not play when it came to, to, to little boys trying to, to, to come around. But if you could talk about you know, growing up with being the baby of, of, yeah. of six, six girls and, and yeah. what that meant and how that prepared you for the rest of the world and gave you insight to different things. Well, it was so interesting because my first sister, I don't remember. I, my first memories of Irene were when she was married. But she had to have made some trips home and she impressed me because she taught me some French carols and I could sing them in French. And so I was telling already about how my mother insisted that I go to school because she really wanted to get her life back and go to ladies' meetings and so forth. 
And so my dad took out a loan, and I made this big trek across town every day, um, took an hour each way. And so um, I'll never forget, this was a private school as part of Atlanta University. In first grade, one of the things they started singing was, Brother James, Brother James, are you sleeping, are you sleeping? Morning bells are ringing, morning bells are ringing, ding dong ding, ding dong ding. And I sat there thunderstruck. So the teacher came over to me and she said, June, why aren't you singing with the other kids? I said, I want to know it in French. <laughs> that kind of child. And so she said, you know, she was a great teacher because what she said was, that's wonderful. Now you learn it in English and then you can teach it to all of us in French. <laughs> Who could not like her? <laughs> so um, that was the thing. They were singing something that made sense. I understood what they were saying, but I identified with the music. Mm -hmm. So um, what else about the school? We had white teachers. One of the people who impressed me right away was the physical ed teacher because we thought they were saying Mr. Pui. Mr. Pui, we thought that was the name. They were saying Miss Dupuy, Miss Dupuy. And this lady looked like a man, and her hair was about that short, blonde, little spiky hair. She always wore pants, either shorts or pants, and I just thought it was Mr. Pui. And so one day the, the alarm went out. Mr. Pree has on a dress. The, the, the school emptied. The classrooms ran out in the hallway. We were looking for Mr. Pree in a dress. And there was Miss Dupree wearing a dress. <laughs> and I think that might have been one of my first sex education lessons right away. <laughs> because it all made sense, but yet it hadn't made sense before. And, and I could see the femininity in this person, and I could see her hair, and so forth. And then years later, I got to know her, got to know more about her, and she loved all of, she taught Jim at Spelman and calisthenics to the little kids. There were white teachers who wrote books about black children, at least three or four. I haven't heard of any more people writing books about children outside of that little nest at Oglethorpe. And um, the state laws said that whites and blacks couldn't um, marry. And um, so there were love affairs where people wanted to get married. Say one person was teaching at Morehouse and one at Spelman. And um, the, the presidents brought them in and talked with them and said, you know, we can't have this. Maybe you two should get married and go to New York or something like that, or go to New York and get married. So um, people did leave the school over time like that. But, um, but when I think about Miss Dupree, I got to know her a little bit um, when, by the time I got to be a grown up. She came back to visit. And I was very glad that I could still talk with her and tell her what, how much excitement she had caused in the, in the whole growing up. But especially the women who wrote books. There were three women who wrote books about black children. And that was, and I don't have one now in my old age, I wish I did, but that was phenomenal. And I, well, so I asked the question, it, it, this, is an, this is a cool segue. I asked the question about your sisters because when we talked before, um, eventually you became a sex therapist. And one of your things is, well, I'm the youngest of, of six girls and they were older and, you know, they had been in relationships and, and, and several different things. And so can you tell us, uh, um, John Johnson, uh, the, the owner of Johnson Publications once wrote, how did a nice lady like her become a sex therapist? Talking about me. Yeah. yeah. Can, you, can you discuss that with us? I'm still a nice lady. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I, I've just always been, um, well, okay, when we had um, like a little boy born in the family, my mother would take a diaper and my sister would be changing the baby and she'd just drop the diaper over the baby's genitals, <laughs> hiding. Well, she never did that with a little girl. And of course I know somebody said something about, well, they may urinate and it may hit people, but she also didn't want us to see the penis. My mother was very um, clandestine like that. And in terms of um, 
first time I ever heard of abortion was about some of my sister's friends. And, and I felt so sorry for the girl. Not for the baby, but for the girl, you know. And um, I remember my mother uh, was talking about this mother and this family, how she had helped the girl get the abortion. And I used to say, why didn't she go to the doctor? Why couldn't it be done in a hospital? Well, that's too easy. You know, it took me years to understand that this was an illegal thing. And yet it seemed, years later even, after I found out that it is done in, in medical schools and hospitals throughout most of Europe, uh, but this country is very um, um, ignorant in terms of health, sexual health. And so uh, we, we go through subterfuges and, and prevent things from happening in a normal way, and it becomes very difficult. Um, I was intrigued to go to uh, D.C. to march in one of the marches uh, when they were trying to get uh, Roe versus Wade um, nullified. And, um, and I was horrified at some of the people organized groups that, that would just swell up in the subways because they, they had driven in from whatever part of the country they could assemble people. And the fear on their faces was something I'd never seen before. They were ready to bite somebody or kill somebody. Their, a mob mentality was in the making and, and, I, and because they wanted to protest the marches. I called up all of my friends and asked them, if you can't come out and march, just give money. Just give money. That helps. And um, I used to do a lot of work for NOW, National Organization of Women. But it, it's not women versus men. I was so proud to see men marching, too. I look at European countries, and, and um, they don't understand what makes America so recalcitrant in, in this whole area. So I don't feel like a lot has been done there, you know. And, and so, so to add this, in, or to put it into full context, see, it's a, it's a bigger conversation than, than just sex therapy. We're talking about oh, sexual yes. health. We're talking about women's reproductive health. Right. Um, you know, conversations around uh, birth control. I mean, there, there's a lot more than, there are women issues that men who sit in, state houses and in white houses will make decisions to where uh, women may not have the proper health care. Exactly. And so this is what you're describing to us is a conversation around women working in their own interests. Exactly. And, and that's something that you laid out earlier in terms of in, in talking to women, particularly in sex therapy. We're talking about there, there, was, there was conversations around trauma and your, your work has been to to make that better, make a better life. Right, and, and I, I feel that, that um, in entertainment, there's so much um, that trivializes women in the theater, in arts, even though they have made great success and contribute a lot of the money-making ability of, of um, plays and, and the theater industry and so forth, still, the, to, to, to reduce somebody to their sexual functioning is, is an outrage that I don't think men even begin to understand um, how withering it is. And um, so I don't want to make this like a, um, a pol I don't, well, maybe I'm going to be very, very honest. Yes, I do feel that that's my life's work. That's my life's work. Um, we can cheapen human sexuality so much, but if you, if you take another view, uh, it's just as easy to, um, I don't want to say glorify, but to think of, of sexual bonding and the privilege of being able to give birth, to conceive, to give birth, is, uh, is a miracle. You know, I heard a man once who, who said there are two functions that males can do, that only males can do, and uh, their sexual activities, and we can say them very quickly because there are only two. He can ejaculate, no, he can have an erection, and I've forgotten the Latin term, which means to, uh, it ends in A-T-E, 
and he can ejaculate those or uh, impregnate. Okay. So um, women have five different life cycles of things they can do. First of all, they, they make the egg. They can ovulate. And I should have written them down. Number two, um, I've forgotten. But Adam Brate means to get pregnant, I believe. And then to have the baby, there's another A-T-E word. And then she can lactate, which is to have milk in the mammary glands to nurse the baby. And um, those are things that are exclusive. I've worked with transsexuals, young transsexual men, and I, and I don't mean to use that word as if that's offensive to somebody else. Don't worry. In 20 years, they'll come up with a new word. <laughs> Language in science changes so fast because people get offended and so forth. But transsexual was a perfectly good word uh, that was used many years ago. And there have been many young boys who, before they get into real puberty, begin to experiment with female hormones illegally. And um, by taking them, they can produce milk because we, are, we have mammary glands, all of us. So they can produce milk, and, um, but they, it's not enough to nurse a baby or anything like that. So at any rate, um, to change one's sex legally is a formality, and, and, and yet it's not really satisfying because you can't change the, the structure of the, of the human blood cell. So um, but, but the, am I getting yeah. too far off? No, 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 no. I, this is going to bring us full circle because we're now entering a conversation around full political inclusion. We're talking about policy. Uh, so my, my orientation in terms of me as a scholar is I'm a historian. I focus on African-American, Southern political history. So I study race. And one of the things that I see within black communities, I, I primarily study black people. One of the things I see within black communities is that black communities get very upset when you begin to talk about civil and human rights, particularly when we begin to talk about conversations around the LGBTQ community. And they're like, it's not the same thing, but it is the same thing. We're talking about policies. And so what we're talking, what you're discussing is, is full inclusion. We're, talk, we're looking at this idea of human rights and inclusivity. And there are policies that have been put into place that have often marginalized. And I'm, I'm bringing this up because your father had a, ma a major stay in being the architect of producing an idea of democracy that would play out. And democracy means for the people. Yes. So what we're talking about, I mean, in his day and time, he was a race man. He fought for the political inclusion of black people. But now the world has morphed into something else to where we have to look at collective politics and we look at other marginalized communities. And so to bring this back, can you, can you talk about your father and his, his role in the Masons and yes. with the creation of the Atlanta Negro Voters League and how that sets up Atlanta to eventually become the most politically inclusive city in the United States? Thank you. Tall order. I, I think he, he really, um, he didn't understand why he didn't have a son. <laughs> he used to say, um, Eddie Cantor, I, I understand the man's agony. How could he have five daughters and no son? It defies the law of averages. And, and he really felt that. But I think also he felt that women needed protection. He felt that men should protect women and, and not ever... Um, uh, use women wrongly. He also didn't want a son-in-law to live with us. He, he had seen, he had boarded with different families as a young man, and he had seen an argument break out between the father and the son-in-law, and one of them killed the other one. And he said, I don't ever want, he said, they can visit, but I don't want any pants living in my home. Well, that was before women started wearing pants. <laughs> And I've often thought as a joke, he really wouldn't have approved of women wearing pants, you know. He thought women uh, were, were um, to be protected. He had a chauvinistic uh, viewpoint. Paternalistic is what they call paternalistic. it. Paternalistic. 
which is wonderful, but it isn't freeing. Right. And, and whereas he enjoyed conversation, after a certain point, it would almost give him a headache. He wanted to, let's stop, that's enough now. <laughs> you know? And he had not grown up in, a, in an area or an era that allowed him to see women as equals. You know, for example, when he met my mother, she loved to dance. She was a great dancer, very um, artistic, and, and knew the different steps. And, so, and she was pretty, and she was popular. And so he took her out dancing because he was trying to marry her, but he didn't, he stepped on her feet. He was not coordinated, you know? And that was something that she regretted, but, but she loved dancing. Well, why, the thought that she might go out dancing with someone else, that was repugnant to him. But he did feel that, um, you know, dancing itself, um, he, he was very quick to tell us we couldn't go, or he had to know the boy or something like that, or he didn't really give us permission to go to that party. It was too late. You know, he, he, had, he drew the line unnecessarily. We couldn't um, date I couldn't date till I was in college. Now, fortunately, I went to college at 16, but still, I couldn't date. My friends were dating at 14 and all like that. And we used to tell him, times change, Daddy. I mean, you know, he was still having children well after most people had stopped having children, and they considered that as um, God's gift. But he couldn't understand why he didn't have a boy. And my mother really didn't care. When I was born, I just want to say this quickly, they didn't name me for, um, I think it was four months. Just couldn't, couldn't arouse any enthusiasm for a girl's <laughs> name. So I was the baby. And Irene was away on a scholarship. And she sent back a telegram. People didn't send telegrams much, but in those days, after four months, she sent a telegram and said, why not name her June? And that's how they got that. Yeah. If I had been a boy, of course, I would have been junior, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> we talk about your father and the, uh, you told me that his life work, like the way in which he saw himself, a way in which he ins asserted himself was through uh, the Masonic order. Oh, yeah. yes. He, I always felt like I'll never get to know a part of my father because the Masons were so dear to his heart and they were a secret organization. But when I did get married, he wanted to make my husband a mason the next night. The next night, I mean, he gave us the wedding night, and, and he did. And Hugh went along with that, and I, so, I told him, you don't have to. We were going to stay in Atlanta a day or so, and then we were going to mosey our way up to New York. And, and so he took out the time and became a mason. And I'll never forget, he came home and he told me, he said, your dad really loves you. And, and I felt like, well, that's good to hear. But I didn't really know it like I wanted to know, like face-to-face um, -face talking. You know, I think he felt that women were to be honored or respected or protected, but you weren't a first-class citizen, you know. I don't think he felt that my mother was a first-class citizen, which is, which is um, interesting. I took up tests and measurements in, in my graduate studies. So I had to do a lot of field testing and I used my nieces and nephews. And I'll never forget I had a big assignment over Christmas. And so I was testing my mother and my father. I knew it wasn't valid, but at least it helped me through the questionnaire and so forth. And my father would take so long, like you know, you'd say, what's the purpose of this auditorium? And he'd talk about the lighting and he'd talk about the structure of the floor and how they had to, get to this problem back here with the curtains and all. And then he had answered the question. That took away. It was too much time. It was too much meandering. My mother, I often thought the metaphor I had for her was she had a bow and arrow and she would string it up and boom, get my point. And she got credit for being quick, concise, and accurate. No falder all, no lecture, just so you get my point. You that she it out. Who's more intelligent? <laughs> Intelligence is, is a use of life situations to get what you want.
I mean, that's my definition on the spur of the moment. But the, the authors of intelligence tests don't just think knowing math is, a, is the only index into intelligence. They think they are indices, many kinds of ways of ferreting it out, because it's so complex. And part of the essential part of intelligence is living, making a living, getting along with people, knowing, sizing up where you are, staying alive. You get my point? I get it. So when, in talking to, to Dr. Butts, um, we, we, we talked about a lot of different things. We talked about known histories of Atlanta, and then we talked about unknown histories of Atlanta. Um, but if you've seen the movie Forrest Gump and how Forrest Gump was like at every major historical event uh, <laughs> to the present, uh, Dr. Butts and I began to talk, and she began to tell me these connections that she had to these very prominent Atlantans that really did change, really did make this world more inclusive. I mean, uh, Selena Sloan Butler, Yes. Uh, w. E. B. Du Bois. Uh, you know, just you know, people that you would come in contact with. Should I share that about Dr. Du Bois? Yes, please do. Okay. That's, that's where we're going. And I don't want to run out the time, but we used to go to the YWCA to eat meals in Harlem because their cafeteria was very, very well known. And um, once we were in the YWCA on a on a business trip with my father, that is, Maddie Wilden and myself, and my mother and father, and we were. We were coming up the steps, and, and we were coming down the steps, and Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois was rushing up the steps. So he tipped his hat to my dad, tipped his hat. And my dad called out, oh, Dr. Du Bois, I want to take a minute, please. I want you to meet my two youngest daughters. And Dr. Du Bois tipped his hat again and said, sorry, Dobbs, I haven't time. And he bounded up the steps. And I looked at my dad. He looked like he was going to cry. He looked so hurt, so you know, for him not to stop to meet somebody's children and shake their hands was an offense. And so what I said, I said, Daddy, he said he didn't have time. And, and you know, the food was there in the cafeteria. I wanted to get on down to the cafeteria. He doesn't have time. Bye. <laughs> so, but, but that meant something to my daddy. He wanted Dr. Du Bois because we didn't bump into him here in Atlanta. And so to be on the steps and meet him there in New York, you know, he would have made time. So just to, just to bring this full circle, you, you spent time in households with uh, very prominent people, all, you know, men, women, uh, and your contemporaries. No problem. They weren't chums. He right. and Dr. Du Bois weren't right, chums. Right, right. Yeah. But, but you and ML were. Oh, yes, chums. we were chums. You and Dr. Yeah. King, my bad. I, I don't want to disrespect Dr. King. Yeah. But um, as, and, and you're six months older, and so what we know of, of as Dr. King was for a 13-year period in the public. Everything that Dr. King did in public was from 26 to 39. Most people don't stop to think about that. He was a very young man when, when he was assassinated. But as you saw, you know, your contemporary, your friend, yeah. You know, skyrocket to the popular, the public conscious of the world. What did you think of that? I was afraid for him. I was afraid that he had no sense of fear, it seemed, that he was vulnerable. That didn't, like he said, longevity has its place. But he was the most giving person I knew, especially with a brother like A.D. <laughs> A.D. didn't want that. And A.D. used to say, I am not nonviolent. And yet he became crushed. He, he was crushed by the uh, enormity of, um, of what J. Edgar Hoover was able to do. And he had made his way, he and Coretta had made his way to um, James Earl Ray. And wanted to have him talk in a po public interview about what he had been hired to do. And um, all of a sudden, Jer James Earl Ray um, broke out of prison under heavy, heavy guard, but, but there he appeared. I want to just tell one little anecdote. Okay. ML was invited by a group of rabbis to come to one of their resorts upstate New York. 
And um, I know because one of the rabbis, Wolf Kelman, lived in my building. There were 11 rabbis who lived in my building, but the Kelmans were very dear friends with my children and myself and all. And Wolf told me that he spoke to Reverend King and they, they said, um, Dr. King, if you go to Selma, you definitely are going to run into a setup where you'll be killed. Don't go there. Is it that important to be a part of the um, garbage strikers march? Uh, and he said, well, it's going to be somewhere. He's going to be assassinated somewhere. So why not there? And in the midst of all this tension, Wolf's daughter, whose name uh, was Abby, Abigail, who's a friend of my little daughter, Lucia. Uh, Abigail was a little saucy thing, and she ran up to Reverend King, and she said, Dr. King, my, my best friend is Lucia Butts, and she says she knows you. I said, no, you don't. She said, yes, I do. And she said, no. I said, no, you don't. She said, yes, I do. This went on for five minutes. So she said, Dr. King, do you know Lucia Butts? And you know what he said? Well, honey, let's put it like this. I think I know her mother better. He didn't even want to hurt a little smart-ass girl. <laughs> In the last few days of his life, and I think, you know, he wrote books. He wrote many books. He was so busy. We had a job one summer. We saw each other every day right after we finished college. And he would drive up to my house and He'd, you know, walk me out to the door, come around, open the door for me, get in. By the time he got back to the driver's seat, the car would start to move off. And um, I only thought about that later because a person who wrote a book about him, who lives in California, called me up and he was asking, what kind of car did ML have? I can't remember. The, I was in that car every day. I can't tell you the color. I don't, all I remember is the thing would slide off as he got in. And I told him that. And he said, um, well, he must have had the handbrake or something like that. But I, I thought again, you know, there are sex differences. And I had little nephews who knew cars when they were three years old. Cars I couldn't, I couldn't see. What is he going by? What is he looking at? But I had one little nephew who used to say, Mommy, look, that award. And that a Cadillac, mm -hmm. and that a that a Pontac, mm -hmm. you know, and it was just a car to me. <laughs> well, is there anything else that you want to give us before I open the floor for questions? No, I would invite questions, and I can't think of anything. Something may come up from the questions. I hope, sure. if we haven't worn you out. <laughs> All right. Well, well, the gentleman in the back had his hand raised first, and then we'll come here. Yes. About Booker T. Washington High School, yes, I was terrified. It was so crowded. It was so crowded. And um, there were fights. I'd never seen students and teachers fight. And um, the girls' room stank. On a Monday morning, you could go in. But Monday afternoon, you didn't want to go in there. And you couldn't go in there Friday. You know, it was a mess. It was just overcrowded. And, um, and there were all kinds of ripples within that scenario. What about him? Any memories of him? No, I don't think we, I don't remember anything. I remember a little bit about his sister, but he was kind of lost in the swirl. I didn't get to know him till toward the end of Washington High. Yeah. And there were like 10,000 students. I mean, it was. Oh, it was so crowded, I can't tell you. Terribly, terribly crowded. Interestingly enough, Mrs. Shivery, uh, who was the girlfriend of W.E.B. Du Bois, taught there. And, and she was one of these, uh, if you didn't have a joke or make fun of Mrs. Shivery, you didn't. Have your eyes open. She was lampoonable. <laughs> yes, please. I would just like to give, I don't have a question. I would love to my job. Thank you. The first one I heard about the sisters was Madam Williams. Yes.
Yes, well, she had a beautiful voice. Thank you. Oh, that's so kind. That's beautiful, and I thank you. <laughs> yes, many people ask where did he get that phrase from, and it was from a poem by um, an Irish author who Maynard gave me the correct name. My daddy mistakenly thought it was Robert Burns. It was not Robert Burns, but he spoke of Auburn, loveliest village of the plains. And he said, we got a sweet Auburn, and it's the money from the banks and the churches and the businesses that makes it, keeps it sweet. And as he would especially say this when we were at a big rally and they were trying to get people to give a cash donation and he would point out so-and-so has a business on Auburn Avenue and it does this and he does that and so forth. So-and-so has another business and all. And that's what makes it sweet. Irene? French, that was Irene. Yes, Irene taught. Three of my sisters taught there. And another three were valedictorians. Millie Millicent, yes, she wasn't a valedictorian, but but she taught there. But Maddie Wilder was a valedictorian and taught there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> that, it's a good Thank thing you. when students complain about how tough you are. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen it yet. Okay. I do plan to. Oh, I see. I'm to see it on the 28th. I don't know where, but I appreciate. Um, your interest in it, and I understand it's a good job. I understand they've done a very, very good job. When Maynard was born, um, my dad was so excited because we had three little granddaughters from the sisters who had married, but there were no boys. That was the thing. He said not only to have six girls, but then the first grandchildren, three granddaughters. I mean, they're nice, but you know, he, he was so obviously <laughs> who he was. But then when Maynard was born, oh, he had to go and see that baby. And my mother had gone out there to help with the other children and so forth, out to Dallas, Texas. So we had three cars that drove from Atlanta. We picked up one car in Jackson, Mississippi, and all of the relatives went out to see the baby. And he was hideous. <laughs> he was 12 pounds. It looked like a turkey. And and I didn't understand it. And all of us were bringing gifts, you know, to welcome the baby to the family and all. My daddy's gift was his vest pocket pot, um, watch, a 21 jewel Hamilton watch that he kept in his vest pocket. I was 10 years old, and I had a Mickey Mouse watch, which I had liked up until then. <laughs> Suddenly it just looked like Mickey Mouse. And, and I said, Daddy, why are you giving a baby a watch? She's in diapers. And he said, because time is important, and he must know that. I mean, my daddy, you couldn't shame him. You know, you'd try to tweak him or something. He was the same thing. He said, time is important, and he must know that. And I thought, nobody ever told me time was important. <laughs> But, but they acted as though he were important, and he was imperious. <laughs> okay, if I can remember which exactly, about his eating. Yeah, oh gosh, yes, thank you. He and his Maynard Sr. and his brother had a huge house, 
like this street went that way and this street went that way and their lot was this apex here. There were 40 trees on the lot and there were white columns all around the veranda and it went up four flights and they divided the house in the middle. One brother had this half, one brother had that half. And <laughs> the brother who had this half uh, had no children and he and his wife had a beautiful home. The carpets were thick and beautiful and the furniture was polished and, and the copper things gleamed and all. My sister and Maynard had the other half. It was a mess. <laughs> the children drew on the walls. And once I went to visit and the children were drawing on the walls on the second floor. And, and I ran downstairs to my sister and I told her, they're drawing on the walls. And she said, oh, that's because they saw this exhibit by Diego Rivera. <laughs> <laughs> and, and oh, just all kinds of things. I've forgotten what I started to say about the children and Cookies. the what? Cook OK, so Maddie Wilde, thank you. Maddie Wilde and I stayed on the fourth floor in a little um, sun parlor. And I woke up one morning to this smell that came from the kitchen. And I thought, what is that? I mean, I thought it was waffles or something. So I ran down to the kitchen, and there's little four-year-old Maynard. I was 14. He was four. And he was taking out his second tray of Toll House cookies. He had eaten the first tray. And so he was pulling out the second tray. And he looked up at me with this big smile with chocolate on his mouth. And he said, can you make coffee? <laughs> and I said, I'll be back. And I ran up to the third floor where Rini's bedroom was, Rini, my sister, Irene. And I knocked on her door and I said, Maynard's down in the kitchen making his second batch of Toll House cookies. He turned on the oven. I knew that was a no-no. Turned on the oven and he's baking cook, the second batch of cookies. So there was silence for a while. And then finally she was talking to her husband and she said, isn't that something he doesn't even know how to read? <laughs> I gave up. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't complain. So I went back down to the kitchen and made some coffee. <laughs> I told him, oh, I also told him about the 21 jewel Hamilton watch from my father. He never saw it. They must have gotten rid of it, you know, sold it by the time he came up high enough to know about a, an expensive watch. But that's the kind of love my daddy felt. Which, I mean, if you asked my daddy, did he like boys better than girls, he would think, what kind of weird person are you? Of course. <laughs> hey. That just be louder. Dr. King's what? Characteristics. Characteristics. Yes, he had a keen sense of humor. He was a very intelligent guy. He and his brother were like, you know, comedians together. They would put each other on. They had a wonderful relationship, but he knew where he wanted to go. He wasn't just happy being an okay fellow, you know. He, could, he was so quick to get into his life, and he had skipped grades, and he had come through uh, a lot of... Uh, studying, but he wrote either four or five books. And what else he learned? He had trouble um, with languages and so forth. By the time he got into Boston University, he had some real trouble keeping up with different things, academic and all. But they were very proud of him and they wanted all of his papers. And Coretta had to fight to keep the papers uh, together so that you have a collection one of the things she did that, uh, and I know I ramble, but um, he wrote my father a thank you note for his generosity in letting him use his uh, anecdote to put through his own filter, and she removed that thank you note. She wanted him to be responsible for all that he did, and he was, but it doesn't mean that you don't get inspired by others. You, uh, if we were all so self-sufficient, we wouldn't need people, and we desperately need people. Human beings don't function well alone, you know, in any way. But he was a, a, a what can I say? 
He loved his father, and yet he saw that his father had tremendous arguments with grown-up men his age. But he said, as long as I'm in my father's church, this is his church. And he worked it up from his father-in-law. And if he could get along with his father-in-law, I could get along with my father. But he couldn't make all A's like his father wanted him to. But uh, he tried to. He tried. And he was very respectful. And I don't mean like he was a goody two-shoes, but he wouldn't knowingly do things that um, offended his father. When A.D. Uh, was um, in college, a girl got pregnant, and came, she and her parents came to the king's home, and they said, we have a good girl, and she's only been with one boy, and that's A.D., and she's pregnant. And so Reverend King said, well, he's going to have to drop out of school and be a father. And he said, I'll help you, A.D., and he bought him a dry cleaner's business. And he said, you've got to learn this. And after about a year or so, if you're interested, you can go back to school and I'll help you. But for right now, you've got to learn to be a father, a husband and a father. And so A.D. Um, measured up, and he followed his father and his uncles and all those people into becoming a minister. But he was not nonviolent like M.L. was. The only time I ever saw M.L. hit anybody was the time he got mad about the monopoly. But A.D. did try to um, get James Earl Ray to talk, and he couldn't break that through. And so what he did, he and his wife had five children, and he sent her and the children to Florida for a vacation, and then they found his body in the swimming pool. Oh, glad you got here. How are you? Sam Oni and Otha? <laughs> now my day is complete. <laughs> I was at the conference in Jamie, the town Jamie serving and doing our drive kick service. Which is the significant way in which you ask me about your connection, your family's connection to Africa? Because I know that the big My father went to the the I guess coronation, not coronation, no, but to the investiture of uh, Nkrumah. Was it actually Ghana's independence? What's that? Ghana's independence. Yeah, when, when he became um, prime minister or whatever, his type, president or whatever. Yes, my father went to Africa for that visit. He, didn't, he had made a trip to the Holy Land before. The Masons sent him. And... Um, they kept his salary very, very low, but they would give him gifts like Cadillac car every year or every two years. They would improve the house, open up the second floor and made it two-story, and they gave him everything, but they kept his salary very low because they didn't want him to run into income tax trouble, but he did. And the income tax people really were very, very... I was about 14 by this time. They, they felt that, that he was um, purposely holding his salary down and the Masons came in and testified that they didn't want him to get into trouble. That's why they kept his salary nominally very small. I don't know if that's what you were asking, though. Is that what you were asking? Oh, yes. Yes, my niece, who was Maynard's sister, older by two years, they had a very happy marriage, and she was able to bring up two little cousins of his from the time they were babies, and they, they're her children. And so she knew that she had a heart uh, with a lot of problems and that she would not probably live long. So she died around 40, 41, something like that. And she's buried in a sacred place in um, Nigeria, a sacred mountain, and um, um, Abeokuta. I don't say it correctly, I'm sure. <laughs> Mm 
Right. Well, she, yes. Maynard couldn't go to her funeral. I don't know what was the occasion that kept him from going, but he sent his younger brother for her funeral. And um, he was very proud of her. We all were. Thank you for speaking up. Couldn't see you. Well, have we diminished for? Yes, please. They didn't live to see that, nor did they. I'm sorry they didn't live to see that, but I'm glad they didn't live to see me get a divorce because they hated divorce. They just thought it was, it was moral turpitude or whatever. It might not be the right word, turpitude. You done messed up. <laughs> and um, that was the only complaint they had about my oldest sister's first husband. I mean, she only married once. The first son-in-law that they had, he had been divorced. That's Maynard Sr. And in those days, something was wrong with you if you got a divorce. Now it's, it's like ho-hum boring. <laughs> don't tell me about your divorce, honey. I don't want to hear about it. <laughs> yes. I'm sorry. Did you want to speak? No, no. My parents had died. I um, tried to delay the divorce because I didn't want to break up. <laughs> I tried to say, let's separate for a year, have a moratorium, and I can handle a few debts and things that are killing us, and then let's talk in a year from now and see where we are. But the young lady that my husband was involved with wanted to get married and was taking fertility medicine, so she had triplets. And when I heard she was going to have triplets, my lawyer, his lawyer called me and said, you got to let the man go. I mean, he's gone, you know, and um, you have to grant the divorce. And, and I was furious, wretched, horrible, mean, crazy. But all I could say was, um, mm, 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 you know, just I couldn't believe it. But, you know, that's life. Things come along and floor you. Uh, my in-laws didn't see it either because they would not have understood. And um, so anyway, I didn't handle that very well. And that was not just me, it affected my children. And that's one of the things I think when wives, uh, the woman rather, has to put up, usually she doesn't have a, a good standard of living after the divorce. The man's life doesn't change. In new marriages, Wife number two lives about like he did with wife number one. That's a matter of record. But the wife who is number one wife usually goes down economically. Well, I had a doctorate. I could work. I could earn money. But I had very uh, uh, disheveled ways of handling money. So I had to learn. And I had to um, learn um, all kinds of things like the challenge of maybe making a new marriage from time to time when that might come up and, and I could um, really be honest with myself, I thought that it wasn't an answer. Somebody might have gotten along well with one child but not the second child. Or might have liked my son but not the girls. You know, different things. And um, so it wasn't just a matter of who did I like, which is huge, but uh, how well off would all of us be? And so I chose, at least I didn't make another mistake like that. I made a lot of mistakes, but it was not like getting them a new daddy. Okay. Any more questions? I, you've been wonderful audience. Thank you. My friends. Thank you all for coming out. Uh, I'm going to talk with, with Dr. Butts about... Uh, Possibly, you know, working with her, put it on a platform for her to do her own blogs. We've, we've, we've just, we've talked about different things that we write and how you engage the public. Um, I think, I think we are in a, in a day and time to where your perspective is, I, I is will tell you one thing. Um, I had a friend who had a radio program, young guy in D.C., and he used to call it time, the time he called with me was, Ask Dr. Butts. So every Thursday morning from something like 7.30 to 9.30,
he would call me in my kitchen and I would take by the, my phone, sit by the phone, and we would handle sexual family life questions, uh, sex and family life. And uh, it went off beautifully, it went well. And one day he came to me and he said, Dr. Butts, uh, there's a group of ministers who are driving down by bus from somewhere in Michigan. A lot of my husbands and wives who are ministers and they're gonna get arrested at the South African Embassy. They're on their way and they've chosen a date. They're gonna go in and protest outside the embassy and get arrested. Would you like for the two of us to join them? And I thought, I can't think of a better marriage. Sure, that's great, let's do it. <laughs> So we did, and we got up early that morning, and they picked us up in their van, and we went down to the South African Embassy, and around 12 o'clock we got arrested, and they handcuffed the women in front like this, but they handcuffed the men in the back, so it hurts a little more. And we didn't get anything to eat. I think we got some water around 4 o'clock, and we were around 10 o'clock that night getting free. And uh, finally the, the women were released before the men, but I got acquainted with many of them, and many of them had met in civil rights protests. And I said, that's a strong bond that puts you two together, you know. But it was a most interesting day. By the time I got home, my telephone was ringing, and it was several calls from California because of the time difference, and they had seen me on TV getting arrested. <laughs> and it, it really was unforgettable. It was um, a big, a big meaningful thing, I thought, for the South African Embassy. I see pictures of Soweto today, and it doesn't look like anything has happened. It doesn't look like it's improved or any real business going on, you know. That's another whole story I know. But in, in terms of how they feel about us, uh, American blacks, I don't think they see us as um, the younger brother, you know, that kind of thing. The cord has been cut. What's that? That's what white supremacy does. I can't hear you, David. That's what white supremacy does. Yes, exactly, exactly. And we're at fault for not doing more. I mean, I don't know, I have a young nephew who's over there, uh, he's Maynard's nephew, Paul. Paul, exactly. You know him, how interesting. Small world, yeah. He's trying to do some business interlocking. But I think if we feel, um, if, we, if we feel a kinship, that's a beginning. And, and I think we need to work on ways to make it economic, um, to make it spiritual, first and foremost. And, and it's not just how smart are you or how much money are you making. If you're really spiritually connected with people, you don't, how can you just be related to those people and not all people, not human beings, you know? I, I, um, that's just my view of things. I had thought by the time I was an old lady, we'd be having interplanetary space travel. <laughs> it's coming. I, yeah, it's coming. As I pushed Dr. Butts into the library, we, we went into the Carrie McPheeters gallery, and on the front of the library, she sees the old Atlanta Life headquarters, and now it has Georgia State on it. And then you, I don't know if you've been down the street, but Citizens Trust now has Georgia State on it. And the Royal Peacock top hat has the M bar with Hookah Wednesday. And you have all these, this, this whole area is being gentrified, and. Yeah. As someone who was born and raised in this er area and whose family had real input in this area, if you could briefly just tell us how that makes you feel. I mean, like the, the fact that things are changing so It rapidly. feels amazing. I don't get out very much, and, and I hadn't realized how much I, you, you know, it makes you want to be young. <laughs> it makes you want to be young, and I don't resent getting old. I, I don't want to go back over certain life events ever again. But on the other hand, there's something about um, the vibrancy, the newness, the, the um, chance for growth. I look at the Atlanta skyline as we were driving down. Oh, no, that was Victor who brought me down. And um, 
it's breathtaking. Atlanta has so much charm, so much, you know, um, going on. I, I wish that, that I could communicate with older people because I don't know that I get through to 18 year olds. I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> Thank you for today's opportunity and for being with me. Did I what? Refer to Dr. King as Michael or Martin. Oh, I only knew him as ML, and I knew that that was for Martin. Yeah, I didn't know him as Michael. Kids joked about it. The boys especially would say, you Michael. And, and he said, no, now I'm Martin. And, and I didn't really understand the joke, you know. That may, takes me back to the boys. You know, I start thinking about them. And um, they were neighborhood boys. Uh, th there was one boy from the Middle East who lived there, and his grandfather had some kind of business. I've forgotten what. But he was one of our gang, you might say. But mainly they were black, everybody who lived in, in our ghetto. We didn't know it was a ghetto. <laughs> well, if all hearts and minds are clear, we'll wrap this up today. But thank you so much for coming out. and look forward to more programs offered by our Auburn Avenue Research Library. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>